Hello and welcome to another episode of Attacking Third, a CBS Sports soccer podcast. I'm Sandra Herrera, lead NWSL writer for CBS Sports. Joined today, as always, by my colleague and co-host, Lisa Roman, NWSL analyst and broadcaster. On today's episode, we have a bit of breaking news to go through with all of our listeners. Uh, following the announcement of uh, the Chicago Red Stars head coach, Rory Dame's resignation, Molly Hensley-Clancy of the Washington Post Broke a story about U.S. soccer failing to act on abuse claims against Rory Dame stemming back to 2018. There is a lot to get in through with all of this breaking news, a little bit of a timeline that Lisa and I will do our best to get through uh, with all of you. But first, a quick reminder to follow us on Twitter at Attacking Third. Also, you can head on over to our YouTube page and hit subscribe so that you never miss a new video interview or whenever we go live. Plus, you can catch... Great highlights of NWSL Extended Games, and uh, you can do that over at youtube.com slash attacking third. So, Lisa, with that, how are you doing today? Uh, it's a heavy day, as it tends to be in the NWSL um, this season especially, but um, it's it really started last night, late last night, I'll say, and, and we're going to run through it with everyone, but it's it's good that I have you, Sandra, so I'm thankful for that today. How are you? Likewise, I think that's the space uh, that I'm in. I think when things like this drop, people tend to look to each other for support. And uh, I'm glad that we're here. Uh, there's two of us doing that. And, um, you know, we're going to try to do our best to, to be here uh, for the listeners and, and go through everything uh, that sort of come out uh, recently, really over the course of what feels like the last 24 hours or so. Lisa and I are you know, recording this on uh the monday evening uh in which everything was reported uh, on november the 22nd uh, out of the post uh, and that also includes a press release that was issued by the chicago red stars as well so this all happened within the same day if we're talking about the midnight hour of things um but uh, essentially, Rory, Rory Dames has been accused of misconduct, verbal and emotional abuse, uh, verging on inappropriate relationships uh, between player, uh, players and coach. Um, he is now the fifth male NWSL coach to be accused of misconduct this year. Uh, players have sort of come out and we're seeing all the reaction to this post publishing that, uh, you know, are continuing to criticize the league and team officials for failing to protect and listen to the players. And um, a larger component of this is that within this reporting, there's a bigger lens and that some of the calls to action actually went to U.S. Soccer Federation. And uh, we are learning through this reporting that that is where things stood, that players did not um, hear back uh, from some of these uh, allegations. Lisa? Yeah, I mean, that's really the grand overview of everything. And and before we dive into really the timeline of how all of this unfolded and, and the news broke, um, I think it's important to touch on for maybe those who are just coming here uh, to kind of get caught up on this story, really who Rory Danes is. Um, for one thing, he is a, a soccer coach in the Chicago area, and he has um, a youth soccer club history stemming back from 1996 with Chicago Eclipse Select. So he has raised a lot of young players through the soccer system. Um, and then he started coaching against Chicago Red Stars in 2011. Uh, as of yesterday, he was the longest NWSL tenured coach in the league. Um, and, and since he was with the Red Stars, he had success with Chicago, uh, reaching the WPSL finals, losing in, in to that, um, in that. And then for four straight years, um, he, from 2015 to 2018, he coached, uh, the Red Stars in the NWSL and he made it to postseason playoffs, uh, losing in the semifinal each year from 2015 to 2018. But it was six straight years that Danes coached, um, his team to the NWSL playoffs. And, and this year, uh, most recently on Saturday, November 20th, uh, it was the third straight championship loss uh, that Rory Danes and the Chicago Red Stars have faced in an NWSL championship. Um, so that's really uh, just a little bit of background on him and where that started. Um, and then uh, after the loss that happened, there was a bit of news that came out uh, pretty late on Saturday or Sunday evening, Sandra. Yeah. I mean, I think it's important to sort of highlight those things, right? We're so it, it sheds light in and sort of paints a picture of the magnitude of, of, of the person that this, that this is. And 
in this story. Um, and it sort of starts the the timeline uh, of this as we're sort of going through this particular former coach's background and, and their ties to a larger soccer system in America, right? So in terms of the timeline of this, uh, it it's almost sort of going from a really big loss in the franchise's history. Like you mentioned, Lisa, they had their third straight championship loss and it was to the Washington Spirit just on November 20th, just on Saturday. Uh, we did a recap of all that. And then there was a Sunday that passes by and here we are on, on a Monday with, with this news and some things sort of kick off the, the red stars losing that championship on a, on a Saturday night. And then that's Sunday night, nearly midnight in Chicago in terms of central time. Uh, the Chicago Red Stars m release a, a statement. So there's a press release that gets put out very, very late at night. And it indicates the following that, that the Chicago Red Stars head coach, Corey Dames, would be resigning. And as the club emailed the, uh, the, the press release to the media, that is where it stood. There was no official, um, there was no official announcement or release pushed out on their socials it was directly to the media um and within the context of that email and that release it was just very it didn't give a lot it just sort of said it was just very suspicious in terms of the timing of it and it, it's really unfortunate because that almost i think lisa was a little bit of the reflection of the state of the league that people's reaction ultimately to that news coming out last night because a lot of West coast people ended up, you know, putting it out there, uh, first, uh, because of the time difference, mm -hmm. um, the immediate reaction to that was like, well, this is suspicious. <laughs> Why is this coming out so late? This is via the inbox of, of various media involved in the space. There's, there's nothing more on, on their official club, social channels. Um, and within that statement, it, said that it's a it's a it's a resignation that Roy Dames is is you know cited in, in a quote within the press release saying that you know effective today refocusing my attention to my family and future endeavors I'm resigning as coach of the Chicago Red Stars and then it just goes on to just sort of talk a little bit about all of his you know it uses words like remarkable it uses words like excellence and leadership and etc these are all things that read a little bit different after reporting comes out and i think something else that sort of reads a little bit heavier post all of this current publishing um is that within this statement it's a collective club quote that's in there it is not cited to majority owner arnim whistler it is not cited to anyone else in the club. It it's literally just says, under Rory's leadership, we've been a remarkably consistent and excellent club on the field. We continually evaluate our team in front office environment, and given the dynamic change underway in the league, it is time to begin the next chapter of the Red Stars with a search for new leadership of the team, said the Chicago Red Stars. Um, and it closes out with another, uh, you know, uh, sort of awkward line saying, more details regarding the search process and other changes to the organization will be made search. So it ends uh, with, a, I don't want to call it a promise, but it ends with a to, a to be continued mm -hmm. that there's going to be a coaching search and other changes to the organization. Uh, so this is all deep in the night, as obviously as people wake up this day, this following day on Monday, I, you know, I was almost like an aura as if like people are waiting for something else there. Again, it's a, it's a new, it's officially the next day. There is nothing on official club channels, Lisa. And then we start to see there's reporting out of the equalizer that is suggesting that the Red Stars ownership was aware. Rory Dames will be stepping down following the championship saying, uh, tweeting out multiple sources, tell the equalizer that the Red Stars leadership knew of Dames's impending exit from the team prior to Saturday's championship match. And then you have, the official story coming out from the Washington Post uh, from Molly uh, Hensley Clancy. And again, within this story, um, there are seven players that uh, are within this larger reporting. Three, three of them are, are on record and discussing their experiences with this head coach. And throughout this entire piece, 
It absolutely details, you know, controlling, berating, humiliating uh, stories of the players and all of these uh, breaking of boundaries of, of the player coach relationship. And I think you and I, Lisa, something that we were reading through this and, and, and trying to process ourselves was, was within the middle of this reporting and talking about and reading and learning that all of these things that players in 2018 went to the U S soccer federation with these complaints directly about this specific coach, not the NWSL. And at the time, the United States Soccer Federation was the managing partner of NWSL. They oversaw the league, supported it financially, right, through allocated funds specifically for the United States national team players who, if we're looking at the timeline a little bit, Lisa, uh, post-2017, 2018, Kristen Press was was a, a member of the Chicago Red Stars from you know mid twenty fourteen to to the end of of twenty seventeen. So having this the timeline, it's it's it was a little like oh my goodness, like the fact that the component that everything that we've been learning throughout this year about sort of the breakdown of the league and maybe its lack of resources. Right, we we saw a similar angle that came into play during the athletic and Meg Linehan's reporting during uh, with, with Sinead Farrelly and Manashim that there was difficulty in finding things like an HR department, you know? So in 2014, uh, Kristen Press was with this team. And so she had these experiences and went on to, to further talk about that. And then former players, Jen Hoy and uh, Samantha Johnson, also go on record within this piece uh, going into their own experiences uh, with Rory Dames as under his tenure as uh, Chicago Red Stars. But I think the biggest thing that also comes out of this as these players, Lisa, are talking about their experiences, something that they highlight is that nothing happened Mm -hmm. after these allegations were brought forward. They brought these forward and Rory Dames has kept coaching since – 2018. I think that's one of the most shocking things. I mean, it kind of looking at how this all unfolded with the press release um, being released in the middle of the night, I think a lot of um, people that have been following this league throughout this year were waiting. Why is this dropping in the middle of the night? What else is going to come out about Chicago, potentially Rory Deans? Um, I, I think that's fair to say that I, I was waiting and saying, what, what else is going to happen? What when is the other shoe going to drop? And the fact that this was a first reported by Christian Press in 2014, not officially, um, it, it wasn't a formal complaint at that point, but Christian Press, she spoke up about Danes at that point with then president of U.S. soccer, Sunil Galati, and, and saying that Dames created a toxic workplace and it was a toxic environment on the team, yelling at players and and she expressed that she thought this was harassment in 2014. That is so long ago. And and she was dismissed at that point. And she was an employee of U.S. soccer, being on the U.S. women's national team. She's one of those allocated players that gets her salary paid for by U.S. soccer, not by the club that she plays for at the time, Chicago. So she went to her bosses and and expressed these complaints. um, And she was just dismissed with without anything to be done for it. Um, And I think that's important to kind of note. And so after expressing these concerns uh, that Press did, then in 2017, still playing for Chicago, she expressed that she wanted to be traded. She did not want to be playing for him anymore because she already expressed that she felt that his actions were abusive and it was harassment for uh, other players that she was witnessing and everything that was unfolding. Um, And then so 2017, she asked to be traded. And then in 2018, a year later, she did resubmit and re-talk to authorities to submit a formal complaint. Um, but that didn't matter because she was still silenced, Rory. or It, it didn't matter. Press still was silenced. Um, it did say in the reporting that this 2018 uh, formal complaint about Rory Deans did spark an investigation um, uh, because press said she wanted to protect her teammates. And I think that's something that um, 
is to be taken note of that in situations like these, it's not the players that are the superstars are getting a lot of minutes, but it's those that come forward with a voice to protect their teammates that are experiencing the harassment and the abuse. And Press is one of those players that did that and tried to speak up for her teammates. Um, and, and the fact that it did spark an investigation gives a little bit of hope. Um, and, and as you mentioned at the top of this episode, that there were several players that came forward and saying that they wanted to tell their stories to U.S. Soccer Federation, um, saying that I'm willing to recount what I've witnessed on myself and on my teammates and everything. Um, but uh, no apparent action was taken from that. And U.S. Soccer continued to to have Rory Dames be coaching and there was no formal investigation that was made known to players or any follow-ups that were done from U.S. soccer. No one reached out to those players that came forward and and said anything to them again after that. It was almost like, great, you've made this a formal uh, formal complaint and formal investigation was launched, but we're going to keep him in the coaching circle and he's going to continue to stay at his post and it's not going to be known to anyone, which is unfortunately a theme that we're seeing throughout the league. And now it's it's stemming to U.S. soccer, which is even higher above than the league and then NWSL. Yeah, and I, and I think as we're going through the the timeline of things, you know, it's that was that rang the loudest. I think for for you and I as we were going through this piece together, and it just knowing that some allegations were brought forward, right, and an investigation apparently was conducted, but ultimately just didn't go anywhere question mark and so that is sort of where it it sort of came up and then it just died um but when those things happen um people are informed of that so whether the allegations you know or investigations people were informed so red stars majority owner arnold whistler was according to this reporting made aware of these investigations against Dane, but was unable for uh, unavailable for comment uh, on the reporting. Um, but we're talking about something that came up in 2018 that was clearly stemming from the very early days of the club's existence. And we're talking about it now nearly at the end of 2021. <laughs> it's almost 2022. Uh, and within the reporting, there was um, a team spokesperson, Natalie bauer Luce, who said that the team actually never received any final report on the outcome of that investigation or any official recommendations from U.S. soccer on moving forward and said further said that the team had taken steps on its own to try and address what it understood to be the concerns. And so you can kind of maybe look at that and say there was an attempt, but it seems very minimal. Let's just when we're looking at sort of the very stark allegations they're big. And so when you're looking at sort of the, the actions that the team tried to take, like, for example, they cited shifting coaching responsibilities, um, adding regular player surveys for the season, like the seasons, I guess, in terms of exit interviews, um, as small things to try to, you know, put in change for players at the club in light of that investigation. So you're sort of, we're sort of looking at this and you're sort of look like you, it, it's like in an angle in which it's like, you have the knowledge now that you didn't know then. Mm -hmm. And it just, I think it echoes much, much louder when you do have that knowledge and you look at all this and you go, wow. So no. So according to the team spokesperson, there was no final report or official, uh, official recommendations for next steps. So the team made an attempt to try to take some steps of their own but things like shifting coaching responsibilities and adding player surveys, like, was that enough? And we're here in 2021 and, and, and people are having the knowledge and having the resources to say, no, that's actually not enough when you're talking about something like protecting players. So further on, you know, press, other players have criticized um, U.S. soccer's own handling of that investigation. Um, players wanting to tell their stories had had actually never heard responses. The federation 
uh, didn't follow up with them on the investigations and ultimately led to a feeling of, you know, po being powerless. Um, Press is, is quoted in this piece saying that she was terrified of Rory Dames, of what he would do and say if he found out that there was something and being said and that it was tied directly to her. So that's another thing that we're seeing mm -hmm. throughout this is that that constant, constant fear of retaliation that players have with their coaches, even if they are former coaches, it's devastating. And I think we see that. And, and we touched on it, that Rory Dames was a youth coach in Chicago. He is a youth coach in Chicago through the Eclipse soccer uh, program. So a lot of players that, he recruits for Chicago. Um, he's known them for a very long time. And and because of that, it's it's almost like a culture that really happened around them. And because of a, a coach that is so powerful, it's also noted in, in this article, which I think is a really interesting point, is that Chicago doesn't have a GM. So Rory Deans, the head coach, is in charge of making trades, of drafting players, of deciding who's doing anything. He, it is him. He is the sole responsibility person to call all of those shots. So if he doesn't want you on the team anymore, or he doesn't want you to be traded or anything, it's his call and his call alone. There's no one to check him on that. And, and whereas in other clubs, there's a GM to do that and kind of oversee that change in player personnel. Um, so it's not surprising that press felt powerless against him. And, and even after she first said something in 2014, nothing was done about it. And they told her, just let it go. This is what happens at the professional level. And then again, in 2018, uh, when she came forward again, using her name against him and, and with these accusations, um, and still nothing happened. Yeah, that's the definition of powerless. When you open up and you confess something and nothing has happened and it feels like no one is listening. Um, and, and she even went on to say for so many women in this league, uh, you just think you don't have any worth. And if you stand up and if you say what you think is right or wrong, that nobody cares. Um, and that's devastating. And I think we've seen that really unfold throughout this season in the NWSL off the pitch with everything that has been revealed about coaches and uh, we said it at the top, this is the fifth NWSL male coach that has been removed from their position due to accusations and investigations that have been happening, um, yeah. which is just ridiculous that it's taken this long. And then even as all of these things were happening this summer with uh, Richie Burke and Paul Riley, former coaches in the NWSL, like, did Chicago not know? Did they keep hiding things. I think that there's just a lot of distrust that has happened and it's been echoed throughout the last few months, protect the players. And this is a very firm example of no protection for the players um, and, and really what has happened. So after yeah. all, all of this news really dropped and everything happened today on this Monday. Um, we're starting to see, rea or we're continuing to see reaction. We are seeing reactions yeah. and they're continuing to come. And and as we said, this is Monday evening, we're recording this, so I'm sure more will be to come. But I, I think it's important to note that Chicago Local 134, the, the Chicago supporters group um, of the Red Stars, they did put out a statement on Twitter. Um, but it was a very firm statement in that they were reiterating things that they had said months ago to the Chicago front office. They were reminding Chicago front office and fans of the demands that they presented to them almost two months ago uh, after the first stories of manipulation and abuse came out in the league. Um, they reshared their demands on Twitter, some of them making sure that there's a, an HR system in place for these players to go to and have uh, trust within the front office, asking who exactly is on the NWSL board of, of governors? Who, who are those people? Um, and are do they have checks and balances? Is someone keeping an eye over the power that they have to continue to hire coaches like this or to see investigations and know about them and do nothing about it? Uh, again, asking for transparency, something that has been echoed throughout the league from players to supporters groups, to fans, to media, um, and, and just a number of things to make sure that there are power checks in situations like this, that if you're sitting at 
a, a board or an owner's table that you have someone there making sure that the knowledge that you have is correct and safe and that you're doing everything you can to protect the players. So I think that statement from uh, Chicago Local 134 was huge uh, just to kind of reiterate all of their demands that they want from the league and not changing any of them, saying the same things that they were saying months ago that they need to protect the players. Yeah, absolutely. It just And again, it just goes in line with, with everything this league has found themselves faced with. Mm-hmm. There is a deep, deep distrust of the protocols that are in place or were lacking or non-existent um, when it comes to the players uh, in this league and the lack of protections that are in place for them. Um, we're, we're seeing that's not uncommon that the main supporters groups of clubs that have had to go through um, all of the off the field things this year have all had these sort of collective statements from their respective officials uh, supporters group. And it's not shocking (laughs) to see that Chicago's uh, also uh, um, had a sort of statement with a list of demands ready to go in light of, of the news uh, dropping. Uh, and that also includes uh, the NWSL Players Association. We're seeing them react to this as well. Also putting out a statement themselves in Monday evening. And they state that this type of coaching has no place in the National Women's Soccer League, youth soccer, or anywhere else. We stand with Kristen Press, Jen Hoy, Sam Johnson, and any player who comes forward to speak out of abuse of any kind. We've said it before and we'll say it again now. The system has failed us. Through our investigation, we will seek out the root causes of this systematic failures to prevent this from happening to future generations. Nothing short of complete transformation of our league will suffice. And it's very powerful, very powerful unified statement coming from the Players Union. And uh, again, them as well. Also really finding their place in all of this alongside still having to go through ongoing CBA negotiations. It's insane to think about while you're trying to enter into your first ever collective bargaining agreement that adjacent to that, you're having to release statements, issue support, issue resources for minimum things like protection of your players. It is, it is unreal to me that this is something that we are having to react to still. I I agree. I mean, you think it's the bare minimum asking for support for players and that they be protected. Um, And and I know we kind of just ran through that timeline of how everything unfolded, but uh, I think it's important to kind of call out some of the behavior that he has been uh, accused of Um, every it's, it's, there's many different uh, phases of it and many different levels of it. And and what was reported on everything from um, really blurring that line between player and coach and and texting players at all hours of the night, asking to spend significant time with them outside of soccer, grabbing lunch with them, grabbing dinner with them um, frequently alone, uh, personal and, and public attacks on these players. And, and verbal attacks that he he did and that players witnessed, whether it was to them or to their teammates and and using personal information against uh, players to kind of hit them where it hurts. And due to that, it was painful and humiliating at practice, after training, in the locker room, Um, even sexist attacks that were happening at players. Uh, uh, One account, even him yelling at someone that if you can't even talk on the field, what kind of mother are you? Just horrible things that you don't, of course, want to be said about you and yelled at you at your place of work. But the, I think it's really important to note that in this article that players said that this, these were their friends, these were their teammates, and then they didn't want to see them hurt like this. It's just so many things that he he went through. And doing that, and you, you referenced one particular moment, in, in this story about using the personal tax against other players, but like doing that in front of literal your colleagues at this point, yeah. that's their job. Their job is to be a pro soccer player. So their teammates are actually also the colleagues as well. So it's like you're doing this 
in front of people. And it's just so, it's just so devastating. And it's not even, it just was, it was bored. It was like touching. It was almost like you're going through these things, Lisa, these allegations, and it's almost, you're going through them. And it's almost like they're checking every mm -hmm. single box because it's talking about painful, public, humiliating, sexist. There are allegations within there of, of racist attacks from this coach, calling players trailer trash, uh, players deliberately choosing to omit personal information about their personal lives for fear that this coach would literally use it against them. And then withholding things like information about time off, team meetings, uh, and, and utilizing that, the player saying that utilizing that sort of power as a form of, of publishment. You know, saying, oh, we're going to have this type of meeting, whether it's one on one or group, and it's going to be all day, but not actually giving a schedule. And you actually now you need to be ready within a few minutes. Uh, and so that that mess of the, the mental game, the mental tax that that puts on these players in the league, it, it's it's devastating. And it's like going through this, like, like you and I doing this, Lisa, it's like, it's like, okay, so here's checking this box and then checking that box and checking this other box. Like if this was, you know, if this was like misconduct coaching bingo card, it's like almost like the whole card would be full. It's, it's devastating mm -hmm. to, to read all this. It is devastating. And knowing that he was doing this to grown adult women and and trying to, I think it was noted in the article, uh, trying to have control over them. Like they were young girls and, and not letting them do things, not letting them see their family or, or their significant others. Um, it, that's not a safe environment. That is not a safe working environment. And, and players realize that and they tried to do something and they tried to enact change within it, going to who they thought could protect them in U S soccer federation. And, being let down by their employers and and really the head of soccer in the United States, um, not helping them, not standing by their sides, not protecting the players. It's um, it's a tough read, you know. That's the other thing that's been happening into all this. Um, there's been what it feels like almost constant reporting uh, for players, sort of who are finally finding their voices and feeling comfortable or safe enough in some aspects to come forward but it's still equally heartbreaking because even within that when you have the bravery of some players wanting to come forward and put their names to things but still within all this players have that fear of not wanting to come forward and, and, and attach their name to things for for fear of that you know their retribution and like we, we see there's come there's it's a very long read but even even within that there's there's moments where within the reporting and the storytelling that within this culture that there are players who are quoted as, you know, saying thing like what can be considered or viewed as nice things about somebody like Rory Dames. And, you know, I don't, I would hate for uh, any of that to be taken out of context, mm -hmm. you know, and, especially in like a larger piece like that, because these players have said constantly time and time again, and we're seeing it in real time, how there is that very real fear of retribution, that there is that, or not retribution, excuse me, there's a real, uh, very fear of retaliation and that fear of uh, things that can impact your playing career in this league in the future. That, you know, if you put a player, if you ask a player a question and a certain element that, maybe they're probably not going to say X, Y, Z negative thing about a coach in, in real time. No. That's It's like almost it's like a defense mechanism for yourself, you know, and we all have of them. Course, of course. You know not. I mean? so it's just like, it's just like, I would hate for, for any of any things that players have might've said about this coach prior to their own knowledge or, or, or experience of it to be taken like, out of context. Exactly. Uh, and know? and I think you have to take it with a grain of salt. Like you said, in, in a media setting, that's not the time for a player to confess something like that for fear of what could happen and punishment to them. In this article, there were seven sources and only three were named because they wanted to stay anonymous. They don't want their name attached to this. Um, and it's 
a lot of bravery and and a lot of strength for those players to come forward in Kristen Press and Jen Hoy and Sam Johnson to put their name on this, knowing very well and, and having that fear inside of them that this could affect their lives. Um, now, uh, coming forward and speaking about a coach that has a lot of power. And we've seen that in the past in the NWSL. And I don't think that that is to be overlooked, especially when reading the article and maybe there are some um, words about him that aren't the worst, but I, it's also very, very important to note that one nice thing about someone, one one nice sentence about someone doesn't dismiss all of the horrible accusations about that person as well. If you're going to read and believe one, you have to read and believe the other. And I think for so long, we've seen that it's it's been turning a blind eye to all of the accusations that have come forward. Um, and now that it is in the light, um, uh, we'll see. There, there's hopefully more to come of this story, of course, but it's it's crazy, Sandra. It is crazy. Nine out of the 10 coaches in the NWSL left their coaching position this season. Five of them males in coaching positions that were let go for cause. Yeah. And I think that's the more I think that's the more 50%. important. I think that's a more important stat, honestly. And I'm glad that you're yeah. highlighting it again because we look through that, right? We say that it's like, oh, nine out of 10 NWSL coaches have left their coaching positions this year, but not all of those scenarios are the same or look the same or were for the same reasons, right? Some of these are coaches who, you know, went on to pursue other opportunities mm -hmm. of their own. Freya Coombe leaving midseason from Gotham to Angel City, you know, making an adjacent move within the league, right? Mark, Mark Parsons of the Thorns uh, in the beginning of the season talking about, yes, I will be moving on uh, after this season. I want to complete things with with the Thorns and then move on to a national team position with the Netherlands women's soccer team. Uh, and then within this, there are other uh, coaches who have similar scenarios. We we all just feel like we're starting to uh, reflect more deeply on what just happened back in September uh, with Paul Riley, uh, the former head coach of North Carolina Courage. Um, there has been, uh, you know, there has been, you know, discourse around uh, racing Louisville and the termination of Christy Holly and uh, the fact that he too was also uh, terminated uh, uh, from the club for cause, you know, and that's the other angle of that too, is that when, people are talking about and saying things like protect the players. You have to mean that in every facet. You have to mean that in every single way. So if there's a moment, for example, since I'm talking about Louisville right now, if there's a moment where that comes out and it's because it's for cause and that's what it is. If there's an angle there where the victims do not want things to be publicized, that has to be, that has to be respected. Mm -hmm. So you cannot say protect the players and in the same breath, like want to scream about, you know, it's like, uh, you know, why don't we know? Well, maybe because the it's victims the the victims want to be protected, you know? So there's all of these things that come into play. Um, and then we're also sort of seeing something like, you know, Hugh Williams of Kansas City current being moved to a front office technical staff uh, position. And even something like that being met with suspicion, that is very sadly the current state of the league right now, mm -hmm. that they're very even, they're very hardcore built-in base, not even taking into consideration the fan base that they are trying to grow, the casual fan that likes soccer and wants to watch soccer, but that their most rabid fan base are constantly meeting them with suspicion and frustration that there is no trust there. There's absolute, uh, there's absolute broken, broken trust between the league and it's most at the time dedicated fan base. And I feel like there is still that, level of love and care and push and want to support the league. But I feel like that is there only if the league continues to make changes, which again, you have to, you have to take it. Uh, you have to take perhaps in this moment, the lead of, of the players 
themselves, which is why when you see a statement coming out from the Players Association, it's important to know what they say within that statement. Nothing short of a complete transformation of our league will suffice. And so we've been hearing these players come out and release their statements. We're, we're still seeing reaction from it. And like any news cycle, I'm sure, Lisa, we're still going to continue to see players, former, past, present, future, react to these types of things. Um, because when something like this happens, it doesn't just sort of, you know, just sort of stay and just sort of wash away. There, there are people who are human, who, you know, have brains and hearts and minds and thoughts and feelings who are going to react to that. And I think you and I even here together are doing a little bit of that ourselves with each other. It's, it's been, it's been a lot, it's been a lot this whole year and it still is a lot today. It, it is a lot. Um, and it's, it's a lot to go through and to kind of unpack, but again, commend the bravery of players that have spoken up and come forward about this and, and all those that have experienced it and are still fearful and remain anonymous. Um, power to you as well for, for living through these horrible circumstances. Um, I changes to come Sandra, I have to be hopeful that with, with the league that has already made changes um, with their commissioner and, and changes that they say they're going to do investigations and, and hope to be more transparent. I have hope for the future that if not for the league making these changes, that the players will demand these changes um, and they will be made. I'm with you as well. I think they're the ones leading the way. And that's ultimately why I have the same amount of hope. So let's continue to try and uh, cover it as closely as we can and continue to follow that lead. And uh, a little bit of, I guess, additional breaking news to go with all of the other breaking news that we've been discussing, Lisa, along with all of the reactions and statements being put out from former players, uh, current supporters groups, and the Players Union. The Chicago Red Stars uh, have released a statement of their own, and this is actually the first time that they've made a statement, a front-facing statement, since A, their release of Rory Dame's resignation in the middle of the night, and the reporting from the Washington Post. And it reads as follows. It says, we stand with the players who are fiercely advocating for change, and we are committed to doing our part to ensure a safe environment for the league's players, staff, volunteers, and fans. In conjunction with our players, the Chicago Red Stars several weeks ago initiated an independent review of player health and safety and the team's culture and work environment. We intend to implement any recommendations in that review that will strengthen our ability to empower our players, to ensure that everyone's voice is heard, and to foster an environment of continual growth. So um, pretty short and to the point statement um, highlighting a little bit, highlighting, I guess, a new thing that we didn't know, Lisa, that that they apparently have um, been trying to work with the players in light of everything. Um, but doesn't, for me, doesn't sound too much different than perhaps what their reaction was after they didn't hear back from anybody in mm -hmm. 2018. And uh, I got to say, I, that's a little concerning for me that it echoes like a similar statement like that. And, and maybe this stems back to uh, the reports by the Equalizer um, that happened that suggested that Chicago Red Stars ownership was aware that Rory would be stepping down post championship. Uh, maybe it stems back to a little of what this statement is saying, saying that they uh, several weeks ago were working in conjunction with the players. Um, it's not that promising, um, but hey, a statement within 12 hours better than we've seen in the past from other clubs. That's certainly a way to put it for sure. And you know what? Obviously a signal that we'll need to continue uh, covering this as it moves forward. I want to thank everybody uh, for listening to us. As always, hopefully you've been informed. And uh, I want to thank you, Lisa, also for hanging out with me during a tough day. I want to remind everyone to follow us on Twitter at Attacking Third. Or on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, and anywhere you listen to your podcast shows. If you leave us a five-star review on Apple Podcasts with a question, Lisa and I will answer it as part of our mailbag segment. We're also available as video. Subscribe to us on YouTube. Visit youtube.com slash attacking third. We'll be back, of course, with any other updates on this story and anything else that unfolds within it. 
for Sandra Herrera and Lisa Roman. This was Attacking Third.